It came out at the inquiry that the signalman looking after the departing train had mistakenly returned signal 171 to stop fractionally early before the last coaches of the train had passed it. At that precise moment, the other signalman pulled over point lever 95. It was the inevitable human error. What he'd actually intended to do was pull number 96, the lever behind. The two mistakes reinforced each other in a seemingly impossible way. Taking the action slowly, this is what happened. The signal controlling the departing train was number 171. When it was reset, the interlocking between it and point lever 95 was freed. However, when the engine reached the points, another device protected it. It's called a locking bar and prevents you moving the points when a train is already on them. Normally, the points were continuously protected because the engine reached the locking bar before the resetting of the signal freed the interlocking. But on this occasion, because signal 171 was reset early, there was a gap. For 1.9 seconds, the points were unprotected. In that 1.9 seconds, they accidentally pulled the only lever that could produce disaster. To pull it took 1.6 seconds, and incredibly, the 1.6 had fitted into the 1.9. Two trains met just opposite the local hospital, and to take the injured through, they knocked a hole in the hospital wall. The new brickwork, now 45 years old, is still visible. It is an insignificant memorial to the 12 dead, but it's a reminder of the extraordinary degree of safety you need to run a railway. Despite the accident at Hull, by now the signal system and the signalman's errors are the lesser cause of accidents. But another hazard is beginning to show up, error by the train driver. But the principle is the same, recognition that the mistakes will happen, and yet for the equipment somehow to prevent their disastrous consequences. So far, the GWR had done most to help the driver, yet almost 50 years to the day after the disaster at Norton Fitzwarren, another tragedy happened there. It was a November night in 1940 at the height of the London Blitz. The bombs had just stopped falling as the 9.50 p.m. train to Penzance made its way out of London. Driver Stacy's own home in Acton had been bombed the night before, and wartime disruptions had made his train an hour late before it got to Taunton. Now, trains stopping at Taunton are diverted onto the relief lines alongside the platforms, so the main lines can carry through trains straight up the centre. On restarting, there are two alternatives. The stopping trains are normally switched immediately back onto the main line. Alternatively, and less often, they are held on the relief line for four miles until after they've passed through Norton Fitzwarren Station. There, the relief line ends, and they're switched back onto the main line. That evening, when the Penzance train was about to leave, at first the signalman signalled it straight back onto the main line and then changed his mind because a fast newspaper train was coming up behind and he reset its signals for the relief line. When driver Stacy actually left, he thought he was to be routed back in the normal way to the main line, while in fact he was kept to the left on the relief so the paper train could overtake. Mistakenly, he checked the signals to his right, all set to green for the fast paper train. He should have been checking signals to his left. He kept going at full speed, and then, just before the relief line ended, this happened. Stacy had gone straight off the end of the relief line. 27 died. 
The position of the signals, the inspector implied, was confusing, but the essence of it was the driver's mistake. Stacy never forgot it. He said, don't talk to me, I'm a murderer. A year later, he died for no apparent medical reason. The inspector's point about non-standardization of the positioning of signals wasn't acted upon immediately because it was wartime. Later, after the war, nationalization meant that standards had to be worked out nationally. And by then, what's called four-aspect color light signaling seemed to be the system with most to recommend it. Slowly, since nationalization, color light signaling has spread throughout the network. It's not universal yet, but one day it will be. It's based on a green light for go. In what's called the four aspect version, a double yellow means go easy, you may have to slow down. A single yellow means you will have to slow down because the next signal is at present red. Of course, it may change so that you don't actually have to stop. The important thing is that the system gives you more information than did the old semaphores. Now you get two warnings before a red, not just one. What's more, by standardizing the height and position of the signals, they're easier to read. Now we're very near the present, and two names tend to stick in people's recent memory. Harrow in 1952, and Lewisham in 1957. Both were, like Norton Fitzwarren, in the new group of driver errors. St John's is near Lewisham, and the accident there, like Harrow, was caused by a driver passing a series of signals set against him. The 202 deaths in these two accidents underlined in a most tragic way the need for some sort of aid for the driver to bring the state of a signal forcefully to his attention. After Lewisham, public opinion and the inspectors wanted all lines to have an automatic warning system like the one the GWR had invented way back in 1906. That was part mechanical, part electric and operated by ramps in the middle of the track. When an engine passed a signal, underneath it there was an electrically conducting shoe that made contact with the ramp. Now the signal, the ramp and the engine are electrically connected. With a signal at danger, a siren sounded in the cab. If the driver still refused to pay attention, then the brakes were automatically put on. And everything was slowly brought. If it was quite clear to the driver that the system had gone wrong, then he had an override switch to cancel everything out. This system was in the engine that crashed at Norton Fitzwarren, where the driver must have used the cancel switch several times. It underlines the danger that cancelling can become too automatic. On the southern region, traffic is so dense and trains follow each other so closely that in peak hours they're frequently running on yellow, not green signals. The conventional warning system would be hooting so constantly that cancelling its continuous cries of wolf would be totally automatic, and then its function as an aid to the driver is lost. On the Southampton to Bournemouth line, there's a new prototype system that not only warns a driver as he passes an adverse signal, but also brings every signal right into the cab. With the green, you don't need to do anything. But with a yellow or double yellow, you have to accept the signal by cancelling the warning. If the driver's a bit inattentive and makes the inevitable error, like pressing for a double yellow when he should have accepted a single, then the system takes over and puts on the brakes. That device might have saved the Lewisham or Harrow drivers, but things have moved on since then, and the British Rail Research Department is near perfecting another piece of equipment that should give a driver everything he could possibly want.